Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at air pollution and climate change for your GCSE biology. If you want to make sure you know everything that you need to for your exam, then if you sign up to my mailing list you'll get a checklist with everything you need in it. Hi everyone, okay so in this video we're going to be looking at climate change, so climate change that has been caused by global warming, but also a bit of pollution because we're going to be covering air pollution. If you need to look at land and water pollution, then there's another separate video for that as well. So we've talked about indicator species already. So remember, indicator species are species that are particularly sensitive to particular conditions. So if they're present or absent, it can give you an indication of what the habitat is like in terms of pollution. So the indicator species that we use for air pollution are lichens. So you've probably seen lichens before on um, walls or rocks like this and it's these white kind of or it could be green patches around here or you could have seen them on trees or wood and they kind of look like this kind of green or various shades of green to greys and browns and they are a really interesting organism. They're a symbiotic relationship formed between a fungus and an algae or a cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria are just bacteria that can photosynthesize. So fungus, fungi, they can't photosynthesize, but algae and the cyanobacteria can. They are, they are like plants, they can. So um, they kind of have a relationship where they live together. They're part of one kind of organism together. And they're really interesting. So some of these lichen species are very sensitive to air pollution, atmospheric pollution. So when there's very few lichens of a specific species or there's just not many around at all, then that's a, an indication that the air pollution is likely to be very high. If there's a lot of different lichen species and some specific species that need really clean air and they look really sort of big and bushy, then that's an indication that the air pollution would actually be quite low and you've got quite clean air. And this has been used for a really, really long time as like an indicator of pollution. And um, it's one of those ones where we can look at it and use it in towns and cities to help us. OK, so let's have a think about what we mean by air pollution and what's contributing to air pollution. So most air pollution is coming from the burning of fossil fuels. We should hopefully have studied this a lot. So fossil fuels, when we burn them in factories and in cars, um, they release carbon dioxide and also sulfur dioxide. And we're going to talk about the smoke and the particulates that come out that you can see coming out of factories and things and that you can see coming off fires and out of the back of car exhausts as well. And they release all of that into the atmosphere. Another source of air pollution is from farming, particularly of cows and rice, which both release methane into the atmosphere. Rice isn't something we farm in this country because it needs very special requirements of being quite waterlogged so it's often in grown in Asian countries but the growth of rice releases methane so methane and carbon dioxide are both greenhouse gases hopefully we should have done this in geography and other subjects and chemistry as well there's links to it so the burning of fossil fuels and the growing of rice and farming of cattle both release carbon dioxide and methane which are greenhouse gases and also the other elements which we're going to talk about how they impact air pollution as well. Okay, so we're going to have a look at some of the impact of some of the elements that we've talked about that are present in different types of air pollution. So sulfur dioxide, which we've said comes from the burning of fossil fuels, its main issue with sulfur dioxide and air, partly its issues with air pollution is that it causes acid rain. So the sulfur dioxide dissolves in water in the clouds as it rises up from the streets and the roads where it's, it's being released from cars and things and it dissolves in the water and it creates sulfuric acid. That acidic rain is then going to fall down when it rains from the cloud and that can damage trees, it can destroy leaves, it can increase the pH of ponds and lakes as well if a lot of it falls over fresh water and so increasing the pH means it's changing the habitat of the lake for the ponds and some animals can't survive in those pHs and also it damages buildings. As biologists, we're less interested in the damaging of buildings. I know we would have co probably covered it in geography or chemistry, but it's not as important to us as biologists as it is the effects on biological organisms and living organisms. So the smoke, the particulates, which are kind of the small, very small particles, if like soot that you would see if you've had a fire at home or you've burnt anything in a fireplace, you get that black kind of soot residue. That, even if you can't always see it, that's what we can see coming out of various 
car exhausts and from the smoke from chimneys, from power stations, and things like that. This creates something that we call smog. So it's a cloudy haze. It's not just fog. It's way worse than fog. Um, and it creates a haze over cities and some cities can be completely covered and you can, they can disappear from the air with the amount of smog that's present. Specifically, a lot of cities in Asia, they've recently had various issues with things like smog where they've actually had to tell people that they shouldn't be going outside because the air quality is so poor on days when the temperature and the water content and the humidity get to a right mix where we get this really bad smog cloud. It contributes to global dimming, so all of those particles help to reflect sunlight from the atmosphere, which then sort of helps with reducing temperatures. But it also irritates the lungs, it can cause respiratory illnesses, breathing difficulties, it can trigger asthma, and that's why we often have in lots of places around London now, for example, they have places like clean air zones around schools, where lots of children and parents and families are walking to school, and they're breathing in all the traffic particulates and things from the cars and the car exhaust especially children as they're closer to the ground so they're more affected and it can trigger asthma and it can be shown to contribute to lower life expectancy of people that live in cities that are exposed to a lot of this um, as opposed to children and other people who grow up in the countryside with a lot fresher air because there's a lot less traffic and less congestion in the streets it can be quite difficult and really kind of difficult for some people to live in and around cities especially if they have um, respiratory illnesses or asthma because it can really trigger those. So now let's move on to carbon dioxide, which again we've said is released from um, burning of fossil fuels. So this can also, like the sulfur dioxide that can cause acid rain, carbon dioxide in the air can dissolve in oceans and rivers and lakes. So big bodies of water, the carbon dioxide, if it's increased in the atmosphere, more of it is then able to dissolve in the water and it forms carbonic acid. So this then decreases the pH and that affects the aquatic organisms that live there, like we've said. The specific example of thing, uh, an effect of carbon dioxide in this way is coral bleaching. So on my diagram, I've got my healthy coral, which is all bright colours, and you can see all of the different colours in there. And then you can see the bleached coral on the right-hand side, which is completely white. And that's why we say it's been bleached, because it loses its colour and it just reveals the calcium carbonate skeletons of the coral underneath once they're dead. Coral organisms actually kind of die and they reject all of their colourful um, bacteria and algae and things that live there that give them all those beautiful colours and you're just left with the skeleton that they've made out of sort of stone afterwards if the pH gets too low or if the temperature increases as well which can contribute to both. So the other main obviously problem with carbon dioxide is the greenhouse gas along with methane so we've said that methane obviously gets produced from farming cattle and also from rice farming and water vapour is a greenhouse gas as well. Reminder of the greenhouse effect, again, may have done this in geography or chemistry. The greenhouse effect describes how gases in the atmosphere trap heat energy from UV radiation from the sun and also then the infrared radiation that reflects back from the Earth. So more UV radiation will enter the atmosphere and less infrared radiation will leave the atmosphere because it's being trapped and the heat energy is being absorbed by these greenhouse gases. The more greenhouse gases there are in the atmosphere, so the greater the concentration of carbon dioxide and methane, then the more heat energy is going to be trapped. And the more heat energy is trapped, then the greater the temperature increase of the planet. So this increased temperature that's caused by this extra trapping of heat energy happens on a global scale. And so that's why we call it global warming. And this global warming, so the whole of the atmosphere increasing in temperature, contributes to climate change. So the atmosphere is warming or more heat energy is being trapped in the atmosphere. And that is what is causing climate change. Climate change is a list of different things, including um, seasonal changes, extreme weather events, changing of temperatures, increasing and can sometimes mean decreasing or getting more extremely cold or extremely hot. And so it's not just about warming so don't get confused between the two because global warming is kind of the process of this greenhouse effect and that the whole the greenhouse effect is causing the whole planet's atmosphere to increase in temperature but that increase in temperature of the atmosphere affects the actual what happens on the planet on earth in different ways and that's what we're calling climate change for us and as biologists and for this topic the most important thing that we need to think about is how this climate change is then having an impact on biodiversity. So how is it having an impact on living organisms and ecosystems? Okay, so we're going to have a look at some specific 
changes that or specific effects on biodiversity that climate change is causing. So migration patterns is one of them. So as temperatures become hotter or colder, because they can go to either of the extremes, then the migration patterns of birds, insects and mammals could change. So we've got an example here of the Arctic tern, and you can see that they migrate from the Arctic, so where it's very, very cold, and they migrate north up into where it's warmer, and then they will go back again during the winter season. So they move or they migrate, so they go from one place in the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere and back again. And that's to do with when there's most food, when they need to breed, so their babies can't cope with cold temperatures often. So you'll often find most species move to somewhere where it's warmer whenever their winter is cold. But if temperature changes are happening, so spring is happening earlier or the winters are more harsh, they might do this migration at a different time. And it doesn't mean that what's happening in the southern hemisphere would be happening in the northern hemisphere. So if they leave because the winter's too cold or they leave early because spring starts too early in the south, then by the time they make it to the north, they might have missed out on food that's supposedly started to be produced on trees or things like that. Or they might miss out on breeding, the right breeding time and temperatures to make sure that there's enough food for the babies. And there's loads of different reasons why this can cause problems, because the Arctic term could also be food for other organisms, for example. And if they don't arrive, when those organisms need food and are hungry, then they could also have lack of food and that could reduce their population. All of this is in a very delicate balance where things, animals moving and migrating around the planet are reliant on certain things like temperature and food. And then other organisms are reliant on them doing it at the right time as well. That can be changed if the climate and the temperatures change in the different hemispheres in different ways. Then we look at habitat changes. So increased temperatures are going to reduce ice at the poles. So because it's warmer, we're going to get ice melting at the poles of the earth. And so animals that live there and rely on that ice, I'm thinking polar bears, for example, penguins, seals, they live on the ice. If the ice starts to disappear, then they don't have anywhere to live. They have no habitat. That's going to affect their population numbers. But that equally has an impact if the ice is melting, that increases the volume of water in the sea. So it causes sea levels to rise. And I've got a picture of like a flooded city here. So yes, that could have an impact on humans eventually, and especially people who live around the coast. But this idea is that coastal habitats are going to be lost or will be reduced because they're going to be underwater. And so that, again, is going to reduce and take away that coastal habitat, which is where a lot of our organisms rely on and live there. So then their habitat's going to be lost. So reduction in changes in habitat is ultimately going to lead to population numbers decreasing. And then we have weather and distribution. So the climate change and global warming can cause more extreme. So we're talking more flooding, more droughts, more storms, more hurricanes, and also could change the seasons. So make winters colder, summers hotter and drier, um, rainy seasons or monsoon seasons wetter, and just generally more extreme. And so it could be that the temperatures or the weather patterns or the seasons where an organism is currently living is become so extreme or so different from how they are used to it that they have to move elsewhere in order to survive. And so that means they've changed their distribution. So a distribution is normally where an organism is found in a habitat or on the planet. So there'll be a range where an organism is normally found to live. And so if the climate in that area changes so much, they may have to move further north or further south in order for it to be a more appropriate environment for them to live in. An example could be mosquitoes that carry malaria. So vector carrying species, so insects that carry disease or transmit disease, they're usually, a lot of them are usually found in the southern hemisphere, in the tropical, around the equator, because of the temperatures. And so that's where they are adapted to live. If the northern hemispheres and further above the equator become warmer, then there could be an increased range in their distribution. So they could start moving more northwards and we could then start seeing examples of these diseases in places that we haven't before because the species that carry them are able to live in different places because the temperature has increased or decreased. All of these different factors, all of these different um, parts that we've talked about will ultimately reduce biodiversity. So all these effects of climate change will ultimately decrease the number of species and the different number of species. 
partly just because they won't be able to cope with the changes. And ultimately, if a species can't adapt at all, or they can't move or migrate, then they're potentially going to be able to have to go extinct because they might not be able to evolve as fast as the changes are happening to become adapted to these new conditions that are being created by climate change. And we've started seeing that already. Um, there's a few species that are going extinct or have gone extinct in recent years due to human activity, but also due to some of these effects of climate change. OK, so that was a lot. Let's just quickly go through a summary of all the things that we've just talked about there. So we said that air pollution comes from burning fossil fuels and farming rice and cattle. We have said that sulfur dioxide, which comes from burning fossil fuels, contributes to acid rain and how that affects organisms. The smoke and the particulates and the chemicals in the smoke, such as the sulfur dioxide, causes smog and that can cause global dimming, but also breathing problems. So that's an effect on actual humans and organisms. The carbon dioxide and methane are the two greenhouse gases that can be our air pollutants. And as they increase in concentration in the atmosphere because of more burning fossil fuels or more farming, they're going to increase their contribution to global warming. And global warming contributes to climate change. So the atmosphere of the Earth warming up causes climate changes happening on the surface of the Earth. And so they're affecting biodiversity. They're in fact, they're decreasing biodiversity often because they're causing changes to migration patterns. They're reducing habitats. And they're also changing species distribution and where they live due to extreme weather events. So all of that is a summary of what air pollution, the examples of air pollution, and its impact and linking it directly to climate change, which has linked it to some ways that that can reduce biodiversity. So hopefully that was helpful. Ouch. This is why in some videos I like explain scratches. Thank you.